All right, we should be counting down. You're live. All right, everyone. This is Frank Klesitz. Welcome to another episode of Keeping It Real. Uh, I'm with Viral Marketing and Greg Harrelson here, my co-host. Say hi, Greg. Hey, everybody. Good to be here. Century again 21 sells thousands, sells thousands of houses out of Myrtle Beach and probably down the eastern seaboard. Yeah. And uh, we are going to interview John Carbuti today. John, say hi. Hi, guys. How is it? How? Hi. <laughs> You're okay, man. John Carbuti up in up in Connecticut. And the topic today is how to build your own independent real estate broker, not under a franchise. But if you wanted to become a real estate broker and start your own brokerage, we're going to dive deep in how to do that today. Hopefully kind of step by step what we can get to in an hour. There's probably a lot more to it than an hour, but at least a good overview. So you'd walk away today with a, some good insight of like, you know, what, I'm thinking about starting my own brokerage. Do I do it as a brokerage? Do I do it as a team model? What's the profitability? How should I go about doing it? How can I learn from someone's, someone's mistakes? And that is going to be John today. So thank you, yeah. John. But before we get started, I have a couple housekeeping things for you. If you want to watch other episodes of Keeping It Real uh, on our YouTube channel, Keeping It Real, you can watch all the previous episodes that go back to, I think, as early as 2014. You can also go to keepingitreal.com. That's probably a better place to watch is around the website where you can see all of our previous shows with full kind of write-ups of what was talked about on the show that makes it a bit easier for you to find the content that's most relevant to you. Uh, the Real Geeks, that's uh, the host of the show putting this on with us. You can go to their Facebook page. Uh, as well as keeping it real is on podcasts. So if you go to Apple Podcasts, you can listen that way. All right. And if you want updates of the show, go to keepingitreal.com, put your email address in. And whenever we uh, announce a new show or there's a replay available for you, uh, you can uh, we'll only update you with that. You won't get any other email. And for those of you that are joining it late or you want to ask where the replay is, we get that all the time. The replay is right here on YouTube. So once we're done with the live stream, right here on this page is where the replay will be. So with that, thank you for attending. John, welcome. You decided to start your own independent brokerage and more specifically, I think you bought it from your father, but you didn't even really know what you were buying at the time. Is that correct? I, I really didn't. No one told me I was getting into the human resource business at the time. So what was your decision to buy the existing independent brokerage up in Connecticut from your father? And well, what did you get when you bought it? What did you walk into? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. So I love my dad. He was actually in the real estate business since 77 and he started the company in 86. I joined him in 98 and I think I fired myself four times between 98 and um, 2010 when I bought the business and finally he wanted to retire. So it made a lot of sense for me to buy the business. And um, again, it didn't come with a manual at the time. And uh, I thought he was going to kind of help me and mentor me making a transition from a top selling agent into a broker owner. And I kind of had to kind of figure things out for myself and kind of put some systems in place and hire a real estate coach to kind of guide me a little bit. And uh, I, I would say that probably no one made more mistakes than myself going from a top producing agent into a broker owner. And I would also say probably no one more than myself has spent more money on things that didn't work. So mm -hmm. I'd put my money up against the best of them. This is going to be a great interview. I'm excited <laughs> to dive <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to dive into that. But let me really quick, let me give the audience a little context. So last year, 1.9 million GCI yep. in COVID. But obviously there's fuel on the real estate market right now. You think you'll be probably hitting over 3 million GCI this year at your brokerage. With, with, with things are, we're already on pace to hit that 3 million GCI and um, knock on wood, hopefully we kind of surpass that, but yeah, we're sure. definitely on pace. Just to give some people perspective, of the amount of business you're doing sure. uh, in your market, generally with home prices, how many homes is that? So, um, so last year we closed uh, around 66 million with only 238 closed transactions. And um, between our closed transactions and sale pendings, we're already around 41 million this year. Got it. And how many agents do you have? Just get some perspective. Um, to put it in perspective, right now I have 51 um, licensed agents, including five full-time support staff and an inside sales agent that's licensed as well. Got it. Um, but also just to let you know, out of those 51 agents, 21 of those agents joined our firm since January of this year, 2021. Wow. Yeah. What's uh, just curious, I don't want to go down this path right now, but why, why so many joined in January? That seems like quite um, a spike. Well, since January of 2021, because we had made um, we had made a concerted effort to focus on our recruitment 
and feeding the front end and having a very, very deep bench. And um, back in September, I made a very, very key hire with um, uh, a woman that I respect immensely, who I never thought in a million years would be working for our firm. And um, she was in production for 16 years. And then she was in a leadership training management position for four years. And her company actually got bought out. And she had actually started with her mom around the same time when I started in real estate with my dad. So we had a very similar background and we really just kind you of- You found yourself a heck of an operations manager to make I, that happen. I, my, one of my best hires in 23 years. All right. Yeah. So with that context, let's now go back. So you buy the brokerage from your dad. Let's just kind of take the storyline. Yeah. You're, you're, you're selling real estate. You're like, hmm, I think I'm going to take this thing over. I'm going to inherit it. What did you walk into? What were the first things you did? Or what would the, be the first things maybe knowing what you shouldn't have done? What would um, you have done regardless immediately? It's a great This is a question. hard question. It's a very, well, it was a 2010. It was a very difficult time. It was a different market. And um, again, I didn't realize... I didn't realize really what I was getting into. I thought, I didn't really understand what my dad did and why he did certain things. And we had actually butted heads, believe it or not, on certain things that my dad did the way he did it. And I wanted to do it a different way. And it's interesting because after I became a broker owner and then I was responsible for all of the bills and everything else. And then I, I kind of realized why he was doing things a certain way, if that makes sense. Um, but um, what, one of the biggest challenges was uh, I was inheriting agents that had been with my company longer than I was. So they had started with my dad. And then, you know, here's my, you know, here's their broker's son buying the oh, business. And my dad oh, man. just retiring at 65 years old. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I, I would say I wasn't getting that respect from a few of those agents and um, it was really a matter of really stepping up and taking a leadership role and saying, look, I understand this is how it was then. And this is how it's going to be now. And you're either on board or you're not. So we actually got rid of a lot of those agents. And I was bringing on newer agents and training them the way that I wanted them to sell real estate, the way I wanted them to instill confidence and transmit strength with the consumer. So you were the leader and you were also the broker? I was the leader and the broker, yes, when I bought this business. And I was also the top producer. That was another mistake that we could talk about. You know, it was very, I had, I had the wrong mindset getting into a broker owner role, right? I was, I was the number one producer. I bought the business and I was still the number one producer. I was going on listing appointments. I was working with buyers. I was running myself ragged and, you know, my health was suffering. My relationship was suffering. I, you know, I have a great relationship with my wife, but you know, it's just when you when you're working 65, 70, 75 hours a week, and you're trying to sell and work with clients and also run a business, it's no good, you're no good for anybody. How I did realized, you break out of that, man? I mean, that had that's what everyone deals with, that messy middle of the jack of all trades, master of none. You're the broker. You have agents that are looking at the, 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 the older son. That's, that would be really hard, man. You're it was the a top producer. Of, How did you break out of that? What did you do? What would you recommend the audience when they're stuck in that position to do? Well, you know, it, I'm not saying this just because you're here, Frank, but you were a big part of that. You were a big help when I started working with Viral. Um, and I started with um, uh, I started with a, a guy named Matt Wagner um, with a company called Ray, Radio and TV Television Experts, and I got exposed to all of these other broker owners and team leaders from um, around the country who were producing at a very high level. And I'm talking to these guys, and they said, oh, "I got a 30-hour work week. I got a 35-hour work week. Um, I'm working three days a week." on my real estate business. And then I've got up two, three, four other businesses. And, you know, it was great to be able to kind of learn from these guys and ask the right questions and shadow some of these guys. And even believe it or not, I even flew out to a couple of their um, uh, uh, real estate offices in other States. I even flew out to Fargo, North Dakota with one of my buddies up there. You know, that's insightful because you're not plugged into the brokerage that does all the events and brings everyone in. You're a lone wolf. Yeah by yeah. yourself yeah. and you connected through some top agents through me. 
and through others. And that really opened your mind. What did you learn yeah. in those early years when you were dealing with all that stress by going to these offices and what you had to do? I learned that I used to think that there, I used to think that nobody could do it better than me. And I was wrong. I used to think that I could do the best listing presentation. Somebody else couldn't possibly do that. Um, I'm not going on listing presentations. My agents are crushing it and they're getting the listings. Um, I used to think that, um, I used to think that things would fall apart if I wasn't micromanaging things. And what I learned is it's, it's about having the right people. You need the right people. You could have the best systems in the world, but if you don't have the right people to manage those systems, then it doesn't matter. You could have the best systems in the world. It's just not going to work. What did you do? I mean, you have limited resources. You have marketing, you have hires. Take me I back. hired. How, um, how did you go through to start getting out of that, doing all the responsibilities, limited money? Hmm. What did you just start doing to bring in more leads, give it to your agents? Like explain that. Let's go down that process now. What did you do? Well, I, I, I started an inside sales well, well, it wasn't overnight. I didn't do all of this at once, but um, I had hired an executive assistant for myself at the time before I had an office manager. So I hired an executive assistant for myself and I was able to take a lot of these um, non-dollar producing activities off of my plate. And then I started investing in, um, I made the leap with radio for um, lead generation. And that was bringing in a lot of great um, seller leads and seller calls um, and some buyer calls as well. And then I got a, um, you know, I got a really great CRM and really great website. And I started doing a lot of Google pay-per-click and I started um, generating about 200, 250. And then I got up to about 300 leads um, a month coming in from our website, going into a CRM. And then I hired an inside sales agent and I started my own inside sales department and I got those persons to start nurturing those leads and calling those leads. And then all of a sudden it started working. And it was like, wow. That period I, of what to just, you said there sounds terrifying it, because you're the broker, you were the rainmaker and you were writing checks on a lot of things that you had no idea that was going to work. Yeah. You gotta be a little bit of crazy to start your own business and become a broker. Can I say that? <laughs> but, yeah. but, but, but the right kind of crazy, the right kind of risk taker. Um, you've got to believe in yourself and you've got to have a written plan as well. Um, I, I got a real estate coach at the time and I wrote down not 20 different things that I wanted to implement. We wrote down two or three things that we wanted to implement and what the priority was and what the time frame was and when we were going to do it, and when we wrote it down, and I had some accountability, it got done. Um, I think that's one, always been one of my strengths is that I've always been a doer. I've always implemented. I've um, even when I didn't necessarily know what I was doing, I took action and I would implement. And I always thought that was one of my strengths. You know, that's the biggest thing of starting your own business or your own independent brokerage, really is are you to take the risk? Yeah. And that motivation was there to take on all that risk. And Absolutely. most people don't. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, take me back to that growth. Mm -hmm. What were some big mistakes that you made through that long journey you shared there before it became successful that you'd recommend to the audience to definitely not do if they are starting their own independent brokerage? Um, knowing what you know now. Okay. So, I could talk about a lot of things. Think about some of the most painful money mistakes, hiring mistakes. Yes. Maybe how you organized your brokerage. Okay. Yeah, have so, some fun here, man. So I would say I hired a lot of the wrong people. I said yes more than I said no in the beginning when I was hiring agents because I was so desperate to bring those agents on. So in the, in the beginning, we never I didn't focus on culture. I didn't focus on value. I focused on I need people in the seat. I need, I need sales guys. I need, oh, you're, oh, you're in a, you're taking a pre, you're taking a 30 hour pre-licensing class and you need a broker to hold your license. I'll do that. Another mistake I made in the beginning was I created a lot of animals in the sense, or I created some monsters because I started these relationships based on money. 
So whatever people were asking me for, I was giving them splits. I was given 60%, 70, I was given 80% splits because I was desperate in the beginning as a broker just to bring those people on. And I thought, hey, I'll make up my margins and I'll make my profitability on volume. And it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Um, you know, once you, you know, once you start, once you start giving agents whatever they want, so whatever they ask for and, and whatever split they want, and if it doesn't, if it's not part of your culture and it's not part of your, you know, what you're offering, it, it just, it doesn't work. And what I found is I created some of those monsters and they kept asking me for more and they kept asking me for more. And I had one individual, he walked into my office one day and he's like, you know, I want an 85% split where I'm leaving. I said, fine, leave. And he was shocked that I actually said to leave. And then I had to really reconsider my business model because it wasn't working. Um, another mistake that I made in the beginning was allowing um, um, operations managers and people in a leadership position to be licensed and also and be in production and also um, uh, uh manage and train my agents. And it just, it, it doesn't work. I found that it, it doesn't work. And now I'm not saying some brokerages don't work and it won't work where with certain individuals that you allow to be in production, but it just, it, it doesn't work with our team and it doesn't work with the culture because the, the agents that are in production, they many times they feel threatened by um, a sales manager that's also listing properties and out there selling as well. Keep going. This is good stuff. Um, so other mistakes, other things that, man, you did that and you really wish you shouldn't have done as you were building your independent brokerage, that could be a little warning signs for someone watching. Um, signing a lease with my dad on one of the commercial buildings that he owned. <laughs> I, I, I bought my building now. So we actually own our building, which is great. So um, other mistakes. I, 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 I want, I don't want to, I don't want to overlook that one. Yep. Yeah. Because in acquisitions, mergers, and whatnot, when you start getting into, into that realm or that space, one of the biggest challenges is the, the, the owner of the, uh, the brokerage and their lease arrangements. Yes. Or, their, their, or, or sometimes buying the property is the right thing, sometimes it's not. So yeah. you have to really think that through, and especially lease arrangements and escalation clauses and duration. Um, you know, all of those things really matter. So when you, when you, when you, when you touched on that, I, I just want everyone to, to understand, be careful and, and be cautious and think those things through because a lot of people make mistakes in that area. Wouldn't Absolutely. you say if you were going to buy a brokerage and you're going to sign the lease, um, I haven't owned a brokerage, but from a business standpoint, that sounds to me like the biggest risk. Am I wrong when I say that, that, it, it, it's, it's, it's one of the largest risk factors of like, I'm sending a sign a three, four, five year lease here. You know, I, I, I'm going to say it a different way, Frank, is it's one of the hardest things to unwind if things start going south. Yes. Got it. So, I, so I'm agreeing with you, but I don't want to just, you know, it's not that well, I don't want to scare people. It just you really want to be cautious because it's, it's the hardest thing to unwind. So you're stuck with that for the duration. So if you want to change gears, then you got to under, you got to be ready to say to yourself, if I change gears and I can't get out of this lease, I'm going to have to cover this nut and I still may go in this direction, but I still got this nut to cover. So it's kind of like when you're in this process, it's not that you should or you shouldn't, but you should always have a plan B and a plan C and look at the worst case scenario and ask yourself, if I'm faced with the worst case scenario, can I manage that? If the answer is no, be very cautious. Yeah. Great advice. You, Greg. Great Thanks. advice. Let's keep going down this path. I'm getting some good stuff out of you, John, versus the next question I'm going to ask you is what do you recommend people to do? But go back. Think. <clears throat> you started this brokerage. Your whole life has been thrown into it. Your whole emotional, mm -hmm. intellectual self. Are there any other mistakes or things through the whole journey? You're like, man, that was a, I went down that wrong turn and realized that was a dead end. So I had to come back and go this way instead. You gave us some um, of this stuff. Not too many. I mean, you know, I, I'm not, and you know, things are, it's interesting because you're asking me to go back like between when I, st when I bought the business and, and became a broker owner in 2010 to now, like, 
like it's unrecognizable. It's just my whole business model is different. And even all of the people have changed at my entire company and team. So it's so, that was just like a different, that was a, just a whole different world to me thinking back right now. So, um, I mean, it was just, it was, you know, we were, we were, we were really operating mean and lean. You know, I was really watching the dollars. I was really cautious about what I did. So, you know, when I had some marketing opportunities come across, um, you know, my plate, like, like radio, which sounds like a giant risk. It was, I mean, was any, were any other agents doing radio at the time? Nobody in my marketplace. And it was, um, nobody in my marketplace was doing it, which is why I wanted to do it because I wanted to do something different than what all of the other agents were doing. And um, I had actually, I had actually met at another mastermind, um, um, a couple out of state brokers who were doing the radio and all of them had very similar success stories. So, you know, and these were all people that I had respected immensely. So I, I, if anything, I wanted to be them. I wanted to emulate them. And um, when I, when the opportunity came across my lap to jump on board and the gentleman, Matt Wagner wanted to take me on board, I, I didn't think twice about it. And I just jumped into it. And I told him, I said, Matt, I said, if you take me on as a client um, and he'll tell you, I said, I will do whatever you ask me to do. I will not question anything that you ask me to do. I will follow you without fail. I will not question you. I will just do it. If you what was your first, what was your first financial commitment to do that? Just curious. Um, it was around 3,600 a month. Not as much as people would think it is to start yeah. on the radio, but I was Couple only spots a week. I was three spots a week in a, in a morning show. And I was lucky. I was actually lucky to get the morning show. Um, how did it work? Um, believe it or not, I, I got a call and, it, and it's almost unheard of, but I had actually had an inbound call um, that same day after our morning spot ran with a gentleman that had heard us on the radio and he had some questions regarding his house. So that I, you scaled that up and that's working for you now and you're um, doing more radio now. Probably about 60% of my seller business is coming from radio right now. That's incredible. Yeah. Okay. Now, the other expense you talked about building your brokerage, that brought in lots of branding and leads and recognition for you. Yeah. And you took that risk. Yeah. You also hired staff. That's another big giant check to write. Yeah. That you had your executive assistant and you mentioned you hired ISAs, I which hired... at the time was not very popular. They would just send all the leads directly to the agents. It, it wasn't. Now it's popular. I'm... Yeah. And I think you remember I had that really young kid that like the young 20 something year old kid, Bill, that was working with me at the time. And he was doing great. And then um, he just kind of fizzled out because it was, you know, what I had discovered that it was very difficult to find the right personality that wants to make those outbound phone calls Monday so through you were, Friday. You were struggling to get your agents to make the calls, which Greg, you would say the agents make the calls. So I know it's going through Greg's mind, right? Yeah. But at the time you decided, which is another model yeah. to go with hiring somebody hourly to yeah. make the calls, to team up for the agents. Yeah. Yeah. What did that cost? What would you recommend to the audience with regard to maybe getting that in place in their brokerage? Yeah. I mean, it, it, believe it or not, at the time when I started, it wasn't that, I mean, you know, we, 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 we were fine. I was finding someone to make the calls for $12 an hour. And then I had given them a raise to $15 an hour and other companies like will give a percentage um, but I don't necessarily give a percentage of the sale, but I'll bonus my ISA. So like I have, I have one ISA that's been with me for almost a little bit more than six years. She's terrific. Um, she actually moved down to Florida full time because she owns a place down there in um, Rotunda West, but she makes her calls every single day. And um, believe it or not, people are going to be shocked. She still works for 15 bucks an hour making outbound phone calls, but I take care of her handsomely with the bonuses yeah. and she's licensed. She's been licensed from the beginning and, um, but she's never worked with a buyer or seller or a client, nor did she ever want to. So she, she, lives, she lives where she lives out of state. She lives in uh, Rotunda West, Florida. Okay. Yeah. So she's happy living there, making her calls, doing her hourly. And her bonuses. She's, yeah. She's retired. And it's nice that the outbounds license that probably protects you a lot with. Maybe it does. It does. It absolutely not. does. Yeah. So I guess you have a licensed agent making the calls then. <laughs> That's yep. a way to say that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
What about, uh, so you have someone doing outbound to find seller leads. Yeah. Right. And what about actually, inbound with your uh, CRM and the buyer leads that come in? Yeah. I mean, we, um, uh, so, so our CRM is still bringing in, you know, hundreds and hundreds of um, uh, uh, inbound leads every month. And a lot of these buyer leads are sellers. A lot of these buyer leads coming in are actually sellers disguised as buyers. So, you know, um, I, I just want Greg to know all of my agents are making outbound phone calls now. And we've changed <laughs> the culture at my company where you can't, you can't be on my team unless you're making outbound phone calls. In fact, we're not even going to tee up an appointment for you or give you any um, gravy, so to speak, until you could demonstrate that you could sell. And Greg, you'll be impressed with this. Um, my new, one of our newest agents, this woman, Sherry, I'm going to give her a shout out on this. She got licensed three and a half weeks ago. Um, she ran an open house, picked up an unrepresented buyer, had her sign a buyer broker contract and sold her a $420,000 home. That woman demonstrated that she can sell to us and she did what we asked her to do. And now we're going to tee up some appointments for her. And we understand that now she could take that ball and run with it. So that's cool. awesome stuff. Great yeah. stuff. Yeah. So radio, ISAs, you brought staff on board. Yeah. Um, you also worked with me for your database. Yeah. You were a first mover on radio. You were one of the first movers to start kind of using the ISA model when it was very new. So you're very forward thinking there. And I came to you with this crazy idea that maybe you should hop on video and start making some videos and sending them out to your database. I remember. And you were like, okay. And my so first you, videos were terrible too. Yeah. <laughs> so where can people go to see them? Where do you have them now? Well, we have, we have, I have two separate blogs with you. I have my personal blog, which is jonathancarbeauty.com. And then we have an agent training blog called Real Estate Careers in New Haven, uh, real, uh, real estate careers in New Haven.com as well. And um, we have two separate databases for that. So um, one for agents, one for consumers. Exactly. And um, the, the, um, the viral, the viral blog has always worked well for us because it's just another touch point. Um, and I think I had told you this. I, I think I shared the story with you a couple of years ago, Frank. Um, I had a gentleman that had um, called me up. Um, his name was Ron Barilaro, and he called me up on the phone and I actually answered my phone. It was a Wednesday. I still remember. And he goes, oh, is this John? And I said, yeah. He goes, is this John Carbita? I said, yeah, this is John Carbita. How can I help you? He goes, my name's Ron Barilaro Jr. And me and my fiance have a real estate problem and we want to talk to you about it. So I said, normally I would press people for more information, but I was feeling really great that day. And I said, look, um, I said, meet me at my office. I'm on the second floor at 43 Hall Avenue down by the train station in Wallingford. Meet me at three o'clock. He said, I will. And, and, and he goes, I know where you are. And I go, good. And I hung up the phone and we had bets the next day, whether he was going to show up. And he walked in and he goes, hi, I'm John, I'm Ron Barlow. And I said, I'm John Carbuti. Nice to meet you. And we were in our conference room. He goes, this is my fiance, Lisa Ann Hewitt. And I said, hi, Lisa. Nice to meet you. And they sat down and we shut the door. And, they said, and I said, um, I said, so how can I help you? He goes, well, I got a condo to sell in Metacoma Drive. She's got a house to sell over on, um, you know, such and such street, uh, uh, Parker Farms Road. And uh, we want to buy a big house together. And I said, great. So I made an appointment to go see his condo. I made an appointment to go see her house. We sold this condo in like 10 days. We sold her house in like 14 days. And we sold them like this large new construction on 44 Long Hill Road. Anyways, after I made the appointment to go see him, um, they left the conference room and he turns around to me and he says, by the way, I really like your videos. And that's why I, gave, I called you. And he left. And I said to myself, I said to myself, did we drop the ball on this guy? Did anybody not call him? So I went to the CRM and I looked up Ron Barilaro Jr. He was in our system for three and a half months, three phone calls, emails, no response to the phone calls, no response to the emails. And um, the, one of the reasons, but he was, but he was getting those videos from viral marketing from me every two weeks and he was watching the videos and that's why he called. It was a great success story. So I've done six transactions with him, by the way, over the years. Talk about working your past clients, huh? Yeah. So you put 
a past client system in place, you put an outbound calling system in place, you have somebody responding to the inbound leads from the CRM, you did radio, so now you have the support staff and you have leads coming in. Yeah. And now, when did you, in that story, start realizing you needed to get your recruiting game together? Really, truth be told, last year. Truth be told, last year. That was when I had made up my mind that I was going to feed the front end. I needed a very, very deep bench. And I realized that there was no, um, there was no cash flow problems I couldn't fix by bringing in those agents. And I'm starting to see that now. Um, and I realized I needed to, I had an operations manager, but I needed to bring somebody on who's not in production and who, whose only role is to recruit, interview, and train and onboard those agents. And, and I went out and I found that individual with this person, Lisa, and who has been exceeding expectations. So you decided to hire a full-time recruiter? Full-time recruiter. What, what, uh, how did you decide to come to that conclusion? Um, I, I, realized, I realized that I, I could do it, but I would be spreading myself too thin. Um, and I realized I didn't want to do it. And then I, then I asked myself, if I brought those agents on, would I want to train them? No, I don't want to train them. I'll inspire them. I'll motivate them. I'll, I sit in on every one of our morning team huddles every morning at 9 a.m. without fail. I've never, I haven't missed one morning team huddle for 10, 15 minutes. Talk about some of the successes, some of their failures, what's working for them, what's working for the group. But other than that, I don't want to be part of um, the day-to-day -day training and the operations with the agents. And, I, and, and, and my time is too valuable. It's hard. I'm not sure if I could even put a value on an hour of my time right now. And I would rather, you know, I would rather be um, out there doing some of the things that I enjoy doing right now. And uh, um, I have a 16 year old son, I have a 19 year old daughter. And um, it's nice to, I go to the gym with my son every day. He plays football. He's a sophomore in high school. And uh, all he wants to do is lift weights. So I've been going to the gym with him and I put on like 12 pounds. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, question then, Greg, I want you to start chiming in here to get some, mm -hmm. get some in-depth as I know you're yeah. writing notes of things you want to ask. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, two, two questions. Your brokerage, your independent brokerage probably has a place in the mind of the consumer after 10 years of what your brand means, especially with radio and everything else you're doing to the consumer. Absolutely. Your, 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 your brokerage also has a brand to other agents in the marketplace. Yes. In the most simplest and direct way to the consumer, what makes, what problem does your brokerage solve or what makes your brokerage unique in your consumer messaging? Well, um, I think a lot of, a lot of things make us unique, um, in the sense, well, to the consumer, what would the consumer say? Well, um, they would be say they would say that we uh, uh, we hear you on the radio every day. I've had I've had uh, consumers call me up on the phone and say, "Oh, is this John Carpenter? Yeah, I've been hearing you on the radio for years." Chad and AJ say that you're all right. Then you're all right for me, right? Danny Lyons, I've heard you and I've been listening to Danny Lyons for eight years, and all I've heard about is this guy Jonathan Carbuti. There must be something to you guys, and I have a great conversation with him for five or ten minutes. And uh, I set him up with one of my listing specialists and um, radio and calls go to you. What's that? Do you handle the radio calls? I do. I, because they're yeah. solid gold. They are solid gold. And when those radio calls come in and when I answer that phone, they are shocked that John Carbuti is answering that phone. And, you know, for me to just take that time to talk to them and they get to talk to me and that instills confidence and transmits strength. And I hand that off. I mean, our conversion, our conversion from listing appointment to signed contract is just like off of the radio. It, it's over 85%. Yeah. You know, and they're That's not interviewing any other, they're not interviewing any other agents. So it's like, we're really not competing with anybody. It's ours to lose. So to other agents, when you hired your recruiter, these other agents are getting called by all your competition. They're getting called by all the bigger box brokerages, all the unique ones, all the 
recruiting downlines, everything that exists. You're independent. Half my agents got called yesterday. I won't name the company. I know because yeah. okay. they let me know. They let me know every time they call. <laughs> so what makes your brokerage unique in the eye of the agent? Well, I think what makes us unique is that they understand that they truly, truly are part of a team and we're not about lip service. So, you know, we're providing systems, we're providing all the tools and technology. They know that there's, there's, there's no other, you know, it's such a level playing field out there and they understand and we make them understand, they understand that there's, there's no technology out there that's going to make them successful. Or there's no technology out there that anybody else offers that we're not offering. In fact, we're offering more. Um, you know, I don't nick, we don't nickel and dime our agents. So like everybody's on one split and we pay for everything. I pay for marketing. I pay for professional photographies. Not only do I pay for professional photography, um, home warranties, if we need to throw that in cleaning services, we'll send in a perfect, we just listed a house up in Warren, Connecticut. We sent in a professional house cleaner and the seller loved it. And I paid for that. And they're moving to Wisconsin. They, they vacated the property last Friday. Um, all of these services that we offer, all of the support staff, and not to mention, not only are we, not only are we um, paying for the marketing of all of their properties and providing all these services, we're teeing up the ball with those actual appointments with company-generated business. And, and it's interesting, too, because every one of my guys knows they could wake up tomorrow morning and go find a better deal out there. But they understand it's not a better deal. They understand it's about the volume. And also, it's about the culture. They understand that at the end of the day, we have their back. They understand that um, I don't care if I have 51 agents. I don't care if I have 100 agents. I don't care if I get to 200 agents. I want to know the name of every single person that works at my company, and I want to have a personal relationship with them. I'll add this in there too, John. Um, John uh, lived in Japan and taught English. Did you, John? It's a little, it's a, not many people know that for two years. Yes. Yes. John and, taught and, English for two years. And I met my wife over there. Not a lot of people know that. I met a blonde haired, blue eyed, Polish Ukrainian girl from Pittsburgh. <laughs> I had to go to Japan to meet a girl from Pittsburgh. Yeah. I think people um, could pick up even the past 30 minutes that you're a nice guy. <laughs> you're a really nice guy. I am. And I'm not a doormat though, but I am a nice no, guy. No, you're not. Yeah. You're not. You're yeah. a nice guy yeah. and you're not a doormat <laughs> by no means, but you have to run a business. But second, you're also a teacher. You are truly a teacher and the patience that is in your DNA mm. to, ha to do what you did. <laughs> Um, by teaching, you know, English in Japan. Oh, absolutely. And I bet you if we interviewed your agents for patience is something that you have of working with your team and they love working with you because you're so, you're non-threatening, but you're still running the business. And yeah. you have such a beautiful blend of that. And your brokerage is such an extension of your character, John. And I just Thank want you. to bring that up too, as, as, as someone that's worked with you and known you, it's one of the reasons why you're successful. And I want the audience to know that when you have your own independent brokerage, it's an extension of your character. And that's you, John. So congratulations. I appreciate that. I, I appreciate so Greg, it. let's get you in here, man. <clears throat> you built obviously a killer brokerage under a, under a brand. But what would you like to ask John, uh, given the audience would like to know they're thinking about starting their own brokerage. What knowledge can John or maybe you share with the audience that can help them in that direction? Well, one thing I'd be curious is to, you know, as I'm listening to you, John, you know, I'm having a hard time uh, deciphering whether or not you're a team or whether or not you're a brokerage. Now, don't, the, the key is, is I'm complimenting you when I say that, yeah. because I think that there is mass confusion in the industry. There are teams that are going to look at you and say, well, that's just the brokerage. And there's brokerage that are going to look at you and say, oh, he's really just a team. Like nobody wants you in their category yeah. because they'd rather not compete against you. And, and I want the audience to know that really, whether we call somebody a team or where we call them a broker. Now, the, some of the characteristics as that, that I've listened to today that, uh, that causes me to say this is things like, um, I pay for everything. I do this. Yeah. I hire the ISAs. I have this done. I have the cleaning done. So it's like, 
Well, okay, that's typically something that a leader would do for the people that are following under their umbrella as a team. That's usually not what a brokerage does. But then on the other side, you have a brokerage. You're the owner of the company. You're the one responsible for the lease. At the end of the day, that label is insignificant. We shouldn't be trying to build a brokerage. We I shouldn't agree. be trying, trying to build a team. We should be trying to follow the example of a Jonathan. And I, I just want to make that observation. But what are your thoughts on like, you, you call, we're calling you a brokerage. You, you seem to be much more than a brokerage in my mind. But what is your opinion about the difference in a brokerage and a team? And what is the difference? Well, I, I, I agree with you. I think the, I think, you know, the lines are getting a little bit blurred. Yeah, so yeah. what I say is I'm a team rich. I mean, in the sense, I'm a broker owner. Yes, yeah. I'm a broker owner, but I choose to run my business the way that I want, want to run my business. So I'm running it like a team. And, you know, I have a weekly leadership team meeting every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. for one hour with my leadership team. And, you know, we talk about what's working and we talk about what's not working for an hour. We don't do it every day. Mm -hmm. We don't do it every hour. We're not texting each other, but for one hour a week, we have that team leadership meeting. And I want to know what's working. I want to know if there's any threats to our business. I want to know if there's any rumblings from any of these agents. I want to know what's working. And, you know, the last six weeks have been very boring team leader <laughs> meetings, which I love, right? Nothing's, nothing's broke. <laughs> yeah, nothing's broken. And it, yeah. it's like, you know, I'm waiting, you know, I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop. I'm like, you know. And that's the thing is when you, when you, you know, and that's a, one of the things is, is that, you know, you, it is about leadership. It is about having people respect you, right? You know, one of the things, one, a guy, one of the other brokers that I respect um, immensely um, had said, you know, you, you know, you're never, ju uh, you know, a, a captain of his ship is never judged on calm waters, right? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, people want to follow a leader. And by the way, not everyone should become a broker. Not everyone should or has the um, characteristics or the patience or the um, stamina to be a broker owner. Um, but, you know, to have, I think, you know, every team in brokerage, you know, to me, just from speaking from past experience, you know, to have five different teams working under my brokerage with me as the broker, all going in five different directions it just, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't, I can't see how that would work. And I'm not saying that other teams can't work under the umbrella of other brokerages, right? And they're very successful at it. It just, for me, it just doesn't work. I don't want, I don't, I don't want other um, agents starting their own teams under Carbuty and company. It's just, you know, it, we're, we're, we're not right for you. Um, but what we're right for is, you know, those agents that, you know, want to do a consistent amount of business and their fair share of business and um, not want to, I don't want my agents up at night staring at the ceiling because they're worried about how are they going to market this client's listing or how are they going to pay for this or how are they going to pay for that? What I love about being a broker owner and also running my business like a team is that I could do whatever I want, you know, You'll love this. I mean, you may not agree with this. You may not agree with this, but I have an agent coming into my office um, uh, who is doing wonderful. And he was actually with another, he started with another brokerage for two years before he joined my team in January of 2019. And by the way, he was on an 80-20 split and he went from an 80-20 split to a 50-50 split on my team. And he is crushing it right now and he will not go anywhere else. Um, but he's coming in to pick up a commission check on a property that's not closing until next Tuesday. I have no problem cutting him a check. That's the value add that I provide for my guys. I'll give him, I'll pay him. I know it's going to close. And if at the end of the day, if it doesn't close, God forbid it fell apart. It's, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to ruin me. If anything, I'll consider that a bonus. It hasn't happened yet, but I, that's the beauty of running a brokerage and a team. You could run it any way you want to run it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I will say that 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 agent appreciates more the fact that he can come in and pick up that commission check and I'm willing to 
let him deposit that into his bank account today when the closing hasn't even happened until next Tuesday. That's worth more than anything, more than any commission split, more than any promise that I could make him or anything else, right? Hey, Frank, can I follow up just real quick? Yeah. So Frank, one of the things that I'm hearing here is this, and, and I think he just is helping me even uh, get, gain more clarity of what my point was, is it wasn't that I, what I'm interpreting is that you didn't necessarily say, I'm going to go open up a brokerage. I'm going to go uh, build a team. He made a conscious decision to become a leader. And he figured out, I can be a leader. I have something of value. I can build structure and I can help other people elevate. And by helping them elevate, by helping them win, he gets to actually kind of ride along and gets to win at a bigger level himself. And, and, and so for those that are listening, it's like, that's the ultimate decision. Yeah. It's like making a decision to become a leader fully committing, go learning what you, you see what he did. He went out and learned from people. He found people to study and, and other leaders. And then he became a leader. And then at this point, he prop, and then he just fell into brokerage because his dad owned the darn thing and he bought it. And I tried to get him to give it to me. He wouldn't give it to me. <laughs> Listen, I have a dad and I bought one from him. Dads are the worst ones to negotiate with. Yeah, I know. I, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Making that note. That was good, Greg. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, it is. I would say, you know, I was going to open the interview with like, what are all the reasons why someone shouldn't do this? <laughs> you know, and then because yeah. we were joking beforehand, like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But I was like, I think people understand that there's. Risk. But here's the reason, though. Here's the reason. The if reason you, to do it is because you grow into it as a leader. You have to. Yes, that's right. And, and yeah. if you're, if 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 being, and not everybody. He says not everyone should own a brokerage. Not everyone should build a team. Not everyone should make a commitment to lead a group of others because that might not be in your heart. That might, and, and that doesn't mean anything if it's not, but that's truly the decision you're, me, you're making. You're making a decision to lead people. And a lot of times when you're the leader, you have to put everyone else in front and in, in, uh, before you. you, you will actually feel lonely. You'll feel like no one's actually giving crap to you. You give yourself to everybody, but no one's there to give anything back to you. That's the decision that we're making. Without a doubt. Without and we a... love it, don't we? We love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, the question I want to ask on that, on this, and I think this involves leadership in some way, more like tangibly, is the whole concept of, especially after COVID, um, having office space. Yeah. So you're seeing so many people, well, it just depends. I don't know. That's why I asked the question is, I think you bought, you said you bought your own building, right, John? Yes. Yes. So you have a beautiful like house you guys work out of. Is that correct? That, that's correct. It's centrally located. It's a beautiful location. Right, beautiful right across place. the town hall. Yeah. Yeah. Like you have a great location, great office. Um, are the agents still coming in as much more or no. is it, or is it more, what's the, the dynamic of the office culture given post COVID and that you have 50 agents yeah. with so, space? So we have, we have two offices. We have one in um, Wallingford and then we have a beautiful office on the shoreline. We have about 1,200 square feet right on the shoreline in Brantford. Um, believe it or not, um, not one of my agents has a desk in either of my offices, nor do I want them. So they understand what they're signing up for. These guys are working, you know, these guys are working out of their homes. Um, we're meeting virtually through a morning Zoom huddle every morning, Monday through Friday. And they are coming into the office to make their phone calls. All 50? Their, um, not all of them, no. <laughs> but certain agents are coming into the Brantford office and Wallingford office to make their phone calls sometimes. And many times they're making their calls from home. Um, I have Lisa Holden and my other operations manager, Andrew Reeves doing weekly one-on-ones with these guys and, you know, just holding them accountable. And, um, and, and believe it or not, when I took everyone's desk away from the office and made them work out of their home, they all became more productive. They all became more productive. Whoa, 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 whoa. Say that again. They all became more productive. Interesting. Yeah. And they're still making their cold calls, even though they're not in the environment of an office. They're still making their calls because they're having their weekly one-on-one. So we're going to know if they're making their calls. I would like to talk about this yeah. because this is a huge shift that's going on. Um, I'll say it viral marketing, John, I agree with you. 
We have 50 employees at Viral. My lease came up, six year lease in November of last year, kind of right when the depths of COVID. We sent everyone home with their computers. Everyone works from home now. And mm -hmm. I sat down with my management team. And I mean this empirically, everything has improved. Yes. Except there are a few people that just do not work well at a home environment. And we just found people that did. Yeah. And um, I think one of the biggest challenges you have with building a brokerage is the lease <laughs> or the yes. office space or the risk of that. And piggybacking off on Greg's question about leadership, it's not necessarily in the office so much for you. Why don't you give the audience what you're doing for leadership tangibly with like meeting structure and bringing people together and accountability through phone calls and Zoom and giving them a place to work ad hoc when they want? How are you executing leadership in a virtual environment? I guess that's the question I want to ask you. Go a little bit deeper um, in that for me. Yeah, I mean, really, it's made it easier. It's made it easier to lead a brokerage with the Zoom calls and the morning huddles. And and by the way, I'm not saying I wanted this pandemic and COVID to happen, and I'm not saying I wanted to to happen to my business, but it was it was a good kick in the you know what for us because you know, we, we weren't doing the morning Zoom meetings with our team. We were doing face-to-face -face meetings. And then we switched to doing the morning team huddles and doing a daily morning huddle with my entire team and four different lender partners and one attorney who, by the way, it's not voluntary for them to be on. It's not, it's not mandatory for them to be on those meetings. It's voluntary, but by choice, they're on every single one of my meetings, including this morning. All four of my lender partners were there. We started in March. You probably of made it year. easy, just, just easier. It's, yeah, but, but yeah. it's powerful, those morning, because what we found is the agents that were showing up for those morning team huddles, it, it was basically, it was, it was putting them in the right mindset. It was great for them to hear you know, the success stories that other agents are having and also for them to hear that they're, you know, they're not the only one that might be experiencing this difficulty or challenge or um, having this particular problem. There's other people just like me, but it also puts them in the right mindset. So then they're ready to start their day, right? After that, we're done. 10, what, time do you, what time do you do them? 9 a.m. Every right. morning, 9 a.m. We're done by 9.15. Monday mornings are probably our longest just coming off the weekend because everybody wants to talk about the offers that they wrote. Then you said the everyone gets one-on-ones? Um, we get weekly one-on-ones. So 50? my, um, yes, my, my, um, they are, my, Lisa Holden and Andrew Talk Reeves. Talk to me here. They so are 50 <laughs> weekly one-on-ones. They are killing themselves. Lisa's, Lisa's actually killing herself right now and she's a little bit overworked so that's something that we gotta we're gonna but they all show they all show up though they do show up face to face she did eight of them yesterday um uh herself in the Branford office okay so, so yeah. these are and, some good and, things we're and by the way not every one of my 51 agents is doing a weekly one-on-ones the ones that the ones that are the ones that are committing to the weekly one-on-ones I got about 19 agents doing weekly one-on-ones not 51. Um, okay, but the agents so that are doing nineteen one on ones. The, yeah, the it's agents that are the agents that are doing the weekly one on ones with Lisa and Andrew are crushing it three to one over the agents that aren't of meeting course. weekly one on one. Yeah. yeah. Now, do you do team meetings, uh, offsites, uh, structured sales trainings on top of the huddles and the one on ones? We're going to start doing that now that we've um, not gotten out of COVID, but now that we're kind of at the tail end of it. So we're going to have some, we're going to bring in, um, um, we're going to do like our own little mastermind and uh, rent out um, uh, a hotel, uh, a local hotel over here in the banquet room and give them breakfast, have some speakers come in, do some masterminds, give them lunch and do like a two day mastermind. Great. What question do you have for John? Let's get to some of the audience questions. Thanks, John. Yeah. Um, you know, so bes I, I would just say besides radio, because that might be a, um, a higher barrier of entry for a lot of people to take that on. Mm -hmm. um, you said that was, uh, you know, uh, roughly 60 percent of your listing opportunities. Yes. What are some uh, additional strategies that you're you're uh, you've created to generate listing opportunities for those that are in your so hands? so we're going old school. We're going old school again. We're doing the circle prospecting. Um, mm -hmm. We just sold a property at eight Homestead Avenue in Derby. Um, property sold itself 30,000 over asking price. And then we circle prospected. Um, and three days later, we got a listing appointment at 
28 Homestead Avenue and um, my identical twin brother is one of my listing specialists. Um, he, he listed that on, on um, Monday. And that was from outbound circle prospecting. And we already had the instant credibility with our sign in front of his neighbors and a sale pending. Again, does the radio predict- help the cold calling? Big time. I mean, at this Absolutely. point, I mean, I, yeah. you can't, that has to be a huge force multiplier. Absolutely. It helps. And when we start to ask people, by the way, do you listen to Weeby 108? Do you listen to Chaz and AJ in the morning on WPLR? Do you listen to Lou and Ethan? Do you listen to Storm and Norman? They say, oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's Carbuti. That's you guys. Oh my God. These names are great, by the way, John. I have no idea who they are. Sort of yeah. the audience. But... I know. I know. That's just <laughs> that's how good. Is. Yeah. But that's, that's, everybody knows those people in Connecticut. I know. And that sort of it. Yeah. Yeah. Storm and Norman. I got He sounds interesting. Yeah. Connecticut's not a very large place. You can get to pretty much anywhere in Connecticut in two hours by car and uh, by car in two hours or less. So I'm just curious, how far does the radio go? You hit Manhattan? You know, oh, I'm hitting, oh, I'm hitting I'm hitting like West. Ch- I'm getting calls from Long Island, New York. I get calls from Westchester, New York. I got I got a good referral source over there. So like if I get any calls from like Westchester or Long Island, I just refer it out. So yeah, good for you. All yeah. right. Well, let's get to some questions. Um and again, I know radio is one of your competitive advantages, but just any general advice you can give to somebody if they're going to go and try to do radio, because that was a big piece of you offered yeah, today. Should, yeah. Someone wants to know, can you maybe expand on, I've never considered radio, which direction should I generally go if they wanted to do that? Um, yeah, I would say, I mean, you know, I would say just kind of dip your toe in the water. And, and I mean, we kind of lucked out with our first on-air radio personality, um, but we had some real duds too. So like we used to start adding, adding and adding and adding. And I mean, we had, you know, I, I had like three, I had, I had, I had given it like six months and I signed on with like three on-air personalities at another station and not one call in six months because we're tracking it. Sometimes it's hard to track where some of this business is coming from, but the radio is pretty, believe it or not, the radio is, is a lot easier to track than most lead sources because they'll tell you. Oh yeah. I called because of the radio. Is the call to action on radio to call or you send them online? What's the call to action? Um, I mean, the call to action is either to call our phone number or Google us. Half the people are picking up the phone and calling us. The other half, the other half are actually Googling us and then they're coming in. You just say just straight up Google them. That's what you say. They're Googling us. Yeah. They'll call us or type us into Google and you'll find us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like it. That's kind of cool. I never heard that call to action. I like it. Go to yeah. Google. Yeah. And we've been focusing on our Google reviews. Now we we got up over 800 Google reviews and hopefully we're going to break a thousand hopefully wow. um, in the next couple weeks. Yeah. Good and that, that's been tremendous for us, the Google reviews, because, yeah. because people aren't necessarily finding us on Google, but they're going and there's like, and, and I've literally had straight up, I had people calling us and calling my agents or my ISA saying, Hey, you know, you had over 800 Google reviews and the next guy had 20. It's a no brainer. So. Yeah. Uh, Paul asks, what would be a good budget to form a new brokerage? Currently a new team of less than of three, less. Than, I'm currently a new team of three, uh, less than a year is doing 2 million in production. Paul wants to be a leader. I have almost nine years of managing broker under my belt, seriously considering. Okay. So here's somebody that's in production that's looking to start their own brokerage that wants to be a leader. Mm -hmm. They have a team of three. They want to go brokerage. What do you recommend? What's a good budget? Where should they spend their money? Well, I think, you know, like, like, like Greg had said, I think you got to be careful with that office space and that office lease, because that could take up a big part of your budget. Um, If it was me starting that team, I would, I would focus on lead generation. I would probably spend that money on um, Google pay-per-click um, maybe jump into radio in that marketplace of no other agents doing it. Um, and, um, and, and I, I, w- I would spend my money on, on, um, um, hiring my first ISA as well. Inbound or outbound? Um, both. both. I would want that ISA doing circle prospecting calls outbound and handling all of the inbound. Inbound blended. Yeah. Okay. And last let, question. Let, let me add something to this. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, and this is specific to this gentleman that- uh, Paul's I question. Think, Paul's question. Um, okay. So here, here's something that's very important to understand. If you go from, st- statistically speaking, <laughs> Paul may be an exception. If you go from where you are right now, 
you got a few people on your team, you're doing 2 million, it's nice and tight, probably extremely profitable, and you go into a brokerage, it'll probably, you'll probably need to get to about 40 agents in a brokerage yes. before it starts to make sense to go that direction. So you're going to go from your current team and you're going to make less money and be have more distractions. And yes. then, and you're going to go backwards and you're not going to start going forward until you get to about 40 people where you're going to say, okay, now I believe I made the right decision because now I'm making a lot more money. I'm, 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 um, I've got good systems in place. I can start doing the things that I want to do again. And, um, versus if you just took your team right where it is right now and doubled the size of your team, stayed small, you would probably make more profit by doing that. Uh, but again, if you're going to go brokerage, just understand it's probably not going to make sense until you get to about agent 40. So if you're thinking of brokerage, you got to be thinking like brokerage. You got to be thinking scale. I agree. I absolutely agree. You got to, I mean, yeah, with a, with a team that small and you still in production, I mean, you got to be mean and yeah. lean, absolutely yeah. mean and lean. Yeah. Last question. Daryl asks, uh, John, what system are you using for phone calls? Um, oh, uh, you mean like a dialer? Yeah. It's like, what do you, what um, else, what do you like? To well, use? our, our, I mean, our CRM, our CRM has, CRM has um, a built in, has a built in, um, got dialer it. for all my agents. So, so pick up, um, uh, yeah. So what's really nice is when you pick a good CRM, there's two options. You could dump everything into it, into an external dialer, or the CRM might have like a dialer built into it where it's clicking right on the call record. Uh, what does Real Geeks have, Greg? Do you know, do you use it inside of Real Geeks at all? Yeah. Well, I mean, you can, you uh, inside the call record, you click the call. Right. In right through Real Geeks, right? Yeah. Right. Yep. Got it. So we'll wrap it up right there. So John, thank you so much for coming on here, man, for this hour. I'm gonna let you hop off of here and Greg and I do a little overtime and we talk about you. Does that sound good? Love it. Thanks so for thanks having for me, guys. On. This was yeah. a lot if of fun. Has any, if anyone has any referrals up in Connecticut, uh, send them up to Carbeauty and Company. He'll answer his phone, right, John? Yeah. And we'll make you look good too. Thanks guys. Yeah. Good Bye. job, see ya. Great information. John's a nice guy, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Seems like to be a really, really, really nice guy. He has yeah. his own little niche. He's the happiest guy with his own thing, uh, working in Connecticut. And, um, I thought it'd be cool to have him on. Like, it's not this big, huge brokerage or a big operation. It's something that here's an artist that has a just enough yeah. entrepreneur in him. You follow me? Yeah. An artist yeah. has just enough entrepreneur in him to build his own thing where he's happy. And uh, I think the, uh, the audience can relate to that. So why don't you share a few things that you learned from this that maybe some key takeaways for the audience that maybe think about starting their own independent brokerage? Well, just to kind of like uh, maybe uh, a continuation of what you were just describing there is I, I think I, I, I think that going in a direction of a brokerage or building a massive team, um, that should be inspired by a passion to do that. Because at, at, at some point, like if I was to talk a little bit more with Jonathan, he, he doesn't seem like he has a job. I mean, in other words, his, his brokerage doesn't seem to be his job. His brokerage seems to be, I could say his passion. It's what he's interested in. It's his sport. It's his hobby. It, it's like, like he, he probably enjoys spending time there. He probably gets a lot of value out of seeing other people win. He probably feels like he wins when he sees someone within his operations winning. He probably actually gets more out of them crossing the finish line than himself crossing the finish line. Those are the things and the characteristics that need to exist if you really wanna step into this because there's a lot of ways to make money Making money is easy. Making money in an area and sustaining that particular process over long periods of time is much more difficult because once we get to money, then we start wondering what the heck do we want to do now that we've got money? 
Well, you should already be doing what you want to do when you already have money. You should be doing that as the process to making money. So I would just say and challenge people to be thinking about what do you really want to be when you grow up? I actually say that, by the way. I say that every year as I'm doing my goals towards the end of the year, probably October, November, I'm going to ask myself, Greg, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I want to make sure that I'm putting myself in that position, not just what am I going to do to make some more money? That's going to translate. If, here's, let me tell you what it looks like. It looks like Jonathan Carbuti. That's what it looks like. He's having fun. And I like that. Craig, I got a business question for you. Sure. Based upon a kind of our capitalism discussions last time on okay. buying whole <laughs> All right. He's, whatnot. You're probably going to put me on the spot. Let's see. Go for it. I got one for you. <laughs> um, most business, not, not most businesses, but you know, it's not unreasonable for someone to take on an equity partner or an angel investor or someone to give them some capital to get started. Not unreasonable. Mm -hmm. No. So if somebody wanted to, you know, get their broker's license and form a new company and put it in an LLC, currently you would own a hundred percent of the LLC. But you could go to someone and say, hey, I'll give you, you know, 10%, 20%, 30% of the equity if you write me a check to get this game started. There's an agent that I know uh, who catapulted himself to one of the top uh, agents in uh, Southern California mm -hmm. <laughs> quickly. And he did that by kind of skipping the bootstrapping of trying to, like, finance all of this just by earning commissions. And he went and had someone invest for an equity stake. And then at some point probably turned around and buy them, bought them out, I think. Um, question. I don't know. Maybe, That's a critical part is having the option to buy it back. Have the option to buy it back. At a That's certain, a very important. Predetermined buy sell agreement. Yes. Predetermined buy sell agreement. Very important. Right. But um, is it, can, can someone be, I don't know if even you know the answer to this, but can someone be a equity partner if they're not licensed? Uh, I believe, I believe the, uh, that's a, probably more of a legal or a real estate I don't, question, but I, I, I know, but I do believe, yes, I do believe that you can, there are some things that you can't, like you can't, I don't believe you can do that. If it's a medical office, if it's a doctor's office, I don't think I can be, but what they do, in, and this is very common, by the way, in the medical field right now is you're starting to see like a lot of specialties, dermatologists, dentists, as they're building their own brick and mortars, okay? Now what they're doing is they're usually new doctors coming out of school and they're going to get an equity partner. Equity's putting up guys, uh, building the building for them, putting them into business. And then technically the doctor is a partner, an equity partner also, but he's also on a salary. But in, in, in I know in the state of South Carolina, they can't, uh, the equity partner can't really own that doctor's practice without being a, have a, a, a license to practice, you know, medicine. But what they do do is they actually, um, they own a, a servicing company or a marketing company that is then, they own that that is paid. So the medical practice is really paying for consulting and medical and they're so doing they're not in the ownership function. position. It's a, it's a monthly fee paid to the marketing company. That's right. Got it. And and and, so and and I say that like it's legit. They're they're providing legitimate back end, probably accounting services, because you could do it with accounting services, marketing services. There's all kinds of legit things that they can do to service this practice. So whatever the money is, depending depending on the laws, that's kind of the way that they did that. Now I don't know if that would apply from the real estate side. Do you find um a competitive advantage for starting your own brokerage is to have an attorney on staff or to um, maybe, have you ever heard of like an attorney starting a real estate brokerage? I don't know of any, but um, you know, I, I don't think that um, I don't see advantages or disadvantages in that particular scenario, you know, um, unless you you're feeling like you're, you're in a high uh, uh, area of risk. You Do know, you feel like your yeah. broker, like, cause that's one of the questions like, you're, you're an agent and you want to get your broker's license, but you're like, oh man, that's so stressful. I don't want to get sued. I don't know what to know. Most like, brokers I would assume... are not getting sued. I mean, it, it's, I mean, there's horror stories out there, but I mean, I'm going to knock on wood here. I, I mean, I've, I've had a broker. I'm not a broker. 
And I, and the reason why I'm not the broker of my companies is because that's a managerial position. I'm not a manager. That's not my skill set. So why would I be a manager? You know, I'm an entrepreneur or I'm a real estate professional. I don't have skills in management. So you and, could and start that. your own brokerage by yeah. hiring a broker and you're a licensed agent? Absolutely. Yeah, you don't have to, you don't, you just have to have a broker in charge. Broker in charge can be a paid person. Got it. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, you don't have to be a broker in charge to do that. But, you know, in, 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 since 1999, when we first started our Century 21 office, my broker's never been sued. Any, um, any tips for if you're starting your own brokerage about maybe just thinking about, because you hear stories about how brokerage may be less profitable and the commissions are being squeezed and whatnot, about how you kind of get involved with title or mortgage. Thoughts on that? General yeah. direction for the audience? Yeah, usually you're not going to be getting into ancillary businesses until you have a certain amount of volume. Right. So, yeah. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't, I don't think it would be common. Um, it's not impossible. Everything's possible, I guess, but I don't think it would be common for somebody. I'm going to start my own brokerage and they're kind of starting off small and I'll go ahead and make sure I make profit by having ancillary businesses. You're not but doing that right away. It, you're going to, you're going to most likely you're going to be doing some sort of JV with those ancillary businesses. And if you're not doing a lot of production, I'm not sure exactly what value you're going to be offering in a JV. I mean, yep. then, then it just looks like a kickback, all right? You're <coughs> doing a couple hundred deals and they're giving you a little bit of a cut. That's a kickback. Probably be, it would be extremely illegal. Um, and so to get in a JV arrangement, you've got to be doing some volume. Usually that comes later on. When did you hire? Do you have a full-time recruiter, Greg? No. You don't? mm So why did you never, John went down the path of a full-time recruiter. Why didn't you? Um, so the, the way that I've recruited, I've, I, the, the difference, and I don't know what John did, right. But I can just share with you my experience. I decided that what I was going to do is I was going to be the educator. And, um, if anybody has seen any podcast or videos that I've done, if you just Google my name, you'll see that I put out a lot of content. I put out a lot of quality content in my opinion, and, um, and I don't charge for it. Um, and I, that was a conscious decision that was intentional. That was like, I am going to, I, I am going to become an educator or do my best to be one of the educators in the industry. And what ends up happening because of that is people consume my content. And then they start to realize that, gosh, I'm learning more from Greg than I am from my own brokerage. And then they give me a call. So I'm focusing on more of put myself out there and attract more than go after and attack. So I'm not like all the companies in my market, they've never had to worry about me recruiting their agents. Are they recruiting mine every day? Yes. Never recruited, never called their agents. Now I've had a lot of their agents call me. Why? Because their agents perceive that I'm delivering more value than where they are. So all your recruiting comes inbound from your content. All my recruiting is being inbound. And the good thing is, is guess who I attract? The right people. Yes, you do. I attract the right people because they already consume my message. So I, and, and, and the ones that don't fit, they don't call. I've had people move across country, get their license and move across country just to come into my office. That is such a compliment. Yeah. I remember yeah. the call. I, I thought it was a crazy call. I remember the call. And I, and, and he said, I I've seen every video you've done. And I knew he did because he even told me that he knew my wife was from the Philippines. And, um, and, 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 and the reason why he knew that is because there's um, my, um, I got some in-laws in, in television in the Philippines and I did an interview on a Filipino channel and it's, you can find it you know, on YouTube. And he saw so many videos of me. He even found that one, which is like extremely hard to find. You have to really be doing your research to find it. You're going like 20 pages deep on Google to find that. Yeah, he went exactly. And, And then I knew, and then he literally moved out here. True story moved out. Wait, I said, I'm not going to talk to you again until you signed up for real estate school. He's in another state, sent, text me the, the, the confirmation that he's in real estate school later that day, 30 days later, whatever, 60 days later, got his license, 
moved to Myrtle Beach. I had a friend give him a few free hotel room for like 10 days. In that 10 days, he ended up like finding a roommate to actually, you know, to share an apartment with. In the first 50 to 60 days, he took 20 listings. Wow. But he had already known, he had already studied all my material. I think you, I think you knew exactly what to do. Yeah, he knew it. Yeah. He do. just wanted to be in the environment. Last question for you, Greg. What's going on with you with after COVID? I asked John the question about, um, yeah. or as COVID settles down, about kind of this whole like uh, working virtually, working from home, people not coming in the office. I know you have an amazing mm -hmm. warehouse where everyone comes in and makes their calls. What's happened with your in-office culture? Has it changed at all? Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, it's hard. It's, uh, I'm curious to know how it's, what's going on with you with that. Yeah, so a, a lot of people that were coming into the office are no longer coming into the office, and um, and some of them are. And um, you know, I accept people where they are, you know, because this is a process. Um, I will say that probably everybody that had people coming into the office, we're not going to get them all back. It's not going to happen. Um, but the new hirees that are coming into the business. They haven't went through the, I used to do this, now I'm not doing that, and now I got to go back and do this again. The new hirees just do it exactly how you explain it. So the offices that are empty around America, they're going to be filled back up with new blood. That's what's going to happen. And then the old blood that no longer comes in the office but stays within the operations, they'll just now uh, start participating more virtually. So the reality is, is a lot of companies are going to expand because they're going to actually keep a lot of the people that are working at home and they're going to be able to fill up the other space with new people. So I see expansion in that scenario. I will say this, though, for anybody out there that is thinking, you know, that, wow, I really like working out of the house. We are going to see that the average production per person is going to go down. Now, I know that there's going to be exceptions. We're going to see the average production per person is going to go down. It's going to happen. It's just we're not seeing it right this second. It's not as evident because the market's so hot. So weaknesses are always hidden in a hot market. But when this market shifts, there's going to be a real challenge, in my opinion. And, um, and, and where a lot of people are really convincing themselves that it's the right thing. But you know what, what, what we've got here is a lot of people had good habits, which was showing up in the office at a certain time, working out in the morning, getting dressed in the morning and showing up. Now, a lot of people, because they don't have to show up, guess what? They also don't get dressed. And because they don't get dressed, guess what they also do? They also wait a little, sleep in a little bit longer because they don't have to go through this routine to get dressed, shower, get dressed, get into the office. So now they're skipping workouts. A lot of people are doing that. And this is going to bubble up and cause less production per person, in my opinion. The challenge is, is that when COVID hit, Frank, it took, we all, let's just assume we had all these great habits and showing up, exercising and all that and getting into the office early was a great habit that you had. When COVID hit, everyone said in the next 24 hours, nobody else can come into the office. So we broke a, 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 a good habit. It only took about an hour to two hours to break a good habit because that was forced upon us based on whatever your local rules were. But it's going to take a year or months or years to get to break the current habit. So we went from good habits to bad habits like that. But we know to go from bad habits back to good habits. Oh, think of smoking, th drinks, drinking or all the addictions that are out there. Think about how hard those habits are to break. To me, there's a lot of bad habits that are forming right now when it comes to how you're structuring your day, your routines and your rituals. And some of those people are never gonna be able to get back to their normal, break those habits and they're gonna suffer financial for it. Now, I'm not saying everybody, somebody on here is right now is arguing with me. There's no doubt about it. Somebody said, oh my God, I'm making more money. I get it, I get it. Look. I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. I'm not talking about what's happening today. But in the next one to two years, one market shift, and let's see how those habits fare. And Frank, you know me, you've been around me a long time. Long time. 
whether we uh, whether we see eye to eye on every single thing one of one of us would say, which I, is no, which is no, and and I'm glad it's no. But one thing you know is I do spend a lot of time thinking about the next market. All the time. I'm thinking about the next market, man. I'm the the last thing I'm thinking about is how do we capitalize on this market? That was like that was two days. You're the, after you're the most hit. like positive negative thinker I know. Like <laughs> I've, I've never heard that one. Can you tell me no, more it's, about it's, that? It's very. Um, hmm. There's a book called Good to Great. Mm. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Great by choice. Mm. Okay. And he tells a story about there were two people that tried to race to the South Pole in the early 1900s. There was this one leader and the other leader. The first leader was like, uh, instead of dogs, let's use um, let's use these new engines. Let's use new machines, and let's get there very quickly so we won't take as much, um, you know, supplies. And um, you know, let's go ahead and use like freeze dried food versus like eating, you know, the seals fat. All right. The other leader. So he started with the assumption that we're going to do well and we're optimistic. The other leader assumed they're all going to die all the time and basically said, uh, we're not using any engines. We're gonna use all dogs. Um, We're gonna take twice as much food. We're gonna do less miles per every day, but the miles we do will be consistent. It'll be consistent 20 miles every day versus like a really good day, let's go really far. Then a bad day, we just stop and not do anything. Regardless of the weather, we're gonna do 20 miles, he said. Long story short, um, the first team died. They all died. And the second team made it through. Mm -hmm. And you remind me of the second team. That's cool. So go read, uh, yeah, go read the admins. Let's see if I can find it for the audience. Yeah, you story, Great by Choice is the book. And yeah, Great by Choice. Are you Admanson or Scott? I'll put it here in the chat. Uh, That's cool. So the question is, I don't know, I don't remember who's who. Yeah. But the question is, are you Admanson or Scott? And I think it's a really he started the whole book that way. Then he went to companies that have stood the test of time, that have always great companies. And they either had one of those two mentalities. Yeah, li- listen, here's the deal. Like as an industry, if the right way to build an amazing business was for all of us one day to go home. We would have already been doing that. Yeah. Let's not, this wasn't by design. This was by, move back and forth, you're blurry for a second. Um, <laughs> Sorry. This, this, yeah, this, there you go. Um, so when we didn't make this change by design, we made this change by default, but we're sticking to the change by default. We're not designing a new change. That's just, that right there tells me it's probably not gonna work out well for everybody. If you're going to start your own brokerage, I'll leave with this based upon the story. Because this is Greg. I'm going to describe Greg to you in four things. I've known <laughs> you for all these years. Yeah, a long time. Greg has one, two, three, four things. He has fanatic discipline. Mm-hmm. Fanatic discipline is something I would absolutely use to describe Greg. And he has empirical creativity. Mm-hmm. When faced with uncertainty, um, he's not necessarily looking to other people. He's looking intelligently at his own thing. And you can read more about that it's in the book. Here's the one we were talking about. You have productive paranoia. <laughs> yes. Would you say you're productively paranoid, Greg? Yeah. Yeah. And my, um, my people that are around me would so agree with that. Productively paranoid, Greg, is you. Uh-huh. And then finally, um, this is here like a level five ambition just a ridiculous amount of ambition. So those four things is what sets it apart like a great company. And if you have those things and you're starting your own brokerage, I think based upon that great book, you'll probably do well from a character standpoint, but that's enough for today. Cool. That's enough overtime. I want to say thank you so much for uh, joining us here on keeping it real. Make sure to go check out real geeks. It's putting these on RealGeeks.com. Yeah. Sign up for a demo. They do a wonderful job. They make these things happen. And um, with that, subscribe to the show here on YouTube. The replay will be right here. And uh, go to keep or, uh, keepingitreal.com to watch more of these shows if you want to get some more good stuff to help you grow a real estate business. So, Greg, as always, thank you so much, and we'll see you all next time. See you, bud. Bye bye.